Thank you very much. So for the uh, last talk of the day, I just wanted to let you know that during the question and answer session with the last talk, uh, I got a text from my wife. So divine intervention, as Terry says, does happen. That my 13-year-old daughter just started in a basketball game, and that's clearly divine intervention if you know anything about all spa athletic ability. And so uh, so I'm, I'm starting this talk in a real happy way. So I'm going to try to exude my happiness with, with, the rest of you, uh, with the rest of you. So what I want to do is I want to pick up um, a little bit where Lorena left off talking about RAS, proteins, and fungi. And I want, wanted to use sort of some biological um, experiments to validate, you know, um, uh, this is a target and to, to ask and answer some questions about uh, different, um, uh, different potential targets for antifungal development. Our interest in, in RAS proteins began with some very, very simple biological experiments. So we all know RAS, um, as Lorraine was talking about, RAS proteins is a super family being, you know, GTP aces that cycle between a, a, an on and off GTP and GDP bound form, um, serving as molecular switches and, and regulating a vast uh, array of different biological processes, but we did a very simple experiment um, looking at one RAS gene in Cryptococcus neoformans several years ago, and when simply mutated, although it was not essential under all conditions, it was essential under uh, th those conditions that are important for in, uh, human infection. So especially at 37 uh, degrees, the RAS mutant fails to grow. And over the s several years, we, in collaboration with many people, I began to tr look at the mechanism of this. So, you know, uh, Leo, you were talking a little bit about, you know, RAS in Canada. There's been a tremendous amount of, of RAS and uh, Saccharomyces uh, looking at its effect in cyclic AMP, uh, you know, generation. And it looks as if for most fungi, uh, that, that, that's an outlier, that RAS proteins tend to be evolved in, in, in these CBC42 like protein um, uh, activation pathways, looking at basic morphogenesis. So, as you go into a stressful environment, and you want to reorient your act inside a skeleton in order to direct budding. Uh, th that's a really uh, dynamic process that involves actin polarization and depolarization of this continual cell cycle. And it is that process that is RAS directed and that process that appears to be uh, um, disrupted uh, at 37 degrees. And so we, we looked and found duplicated RAC and CDC42 uh, GTPases. Um, that seemed to mediate this process, and Lukasz uh, Kozowski, who was here, who was here um, determined the function of the septin proteins in Cryptococcus for this interaction. They seem to be a main target of RAS. So that just uh, sort of goes to show that, that these are involved in very, very uh, fundamental cellular processes of division under stressful uh, situations. So again, thinking about RAS proteins, in addition to just inhibiting the protein itself, um, you, Lorena beautifully uh, described the concept of the post-translational modifications that occur on these, uh, these proteins that allow them to go to the appropriate site in the cell. So two lipid modifications, either the addition of a prenyl group, the, the first thing that happens that it basically attaches it to, to membranes, and a second process I'm going to be talking about later in the talk um, uh, that is a uh, regulated and potentially reversible process, the addition of a second um, fatty acid moiety that will transition it from the, uh, the initial ER membrane and potentially out to the plasma membrane where these proteins can have distinct function. And again, these sites is, uh, um, are, are, uh, occur at cysteines, so the uh, fourth amino acid from the end of, of uh, the molecule, uh, you can barely see it, but in green here, the cysteine that is the site of either farnesylation or geronal geronylation, and then immediately upstream of that, there's either one or maybe uh, several cysteines that would be the site of palmitylation, again, the second post-translational post modification for this protein. And so what we'd like to, you know, just to, to ask the question, how important are these processes on, on fungal physiology and virulence, and especially for cryptococcus? Neoformans. And so we took several different approaches. First, we just looked at this 
basic molecule, the RAS molecule, and began to mutate some of the sites so that we would get rid of all potential um, uh, mo modifications at these sites. And so the first thing we d uh, that we did, this was mainly the work by Connie Nichols uh, in my lab, is that she just um, changed this cysteine uh, to a serine so that, that it could not be um, uh, primylated. And what, this is um, uh, done with a GFP RAS allele, so we see that the normal pattern of protein localization um, uh, of the, the RAS protein of cryptococcus, most of it eventually ends up at the plasma membrane. And it's also, uh, uh, you can see it's present in these endomembrane structures, likely the ER and, the, and especially the, the, the Golgi as it's processing out toward the plasma membrane. And if, if we mutate this one predicted uh, prenylated uh, cysteine, we see complete um, delocalization uh, of the protein and absent plasma membrane um, uh, uh, localization. What happens to the function of this protein uh, is ab it, there's, there's really uh, no function left. So it looks like a RAS mutant um, when, when, when you make that single amino acid uh, change. Um, and as, uh, you know, as we, we, we demonstrated this genetically, and as uh, Lorena uh, also demonstrated, we looked, tried to look pharmacologically as well at <coughs> molecules that may inhibit uh, this process in Cryptococcus and did see um, in, in, um, activity against the whole organism um, that we believe, you know, at least in part, was due to inhibition of RAS protein function. Interestingly, as we look at other compounds that may be inhibiting this and other pathways, this is just a, a little bit of a sidelight to emphasize something also that Marina said, and this is looking at some, of, some compounds that may inhibit some of these post-translational modifications, at least in, in a predicted fashion. And this is Saccharomyces, uh, Schizosaccharomyces pombi um, in the wild type, and some of these compounds have a little bit of inhibition around the disc. Um, and then this is uh, the main mycin A that, we, that, that does have a significant activity. Uh, but when you take the same compounds, the, it's a little bit of a different image here because we just want to show the, the contrast. This is a, a, a Pombi strain that has uh, um, most of the efflux pumps uh, mutated. We can see that many of these compounds now develop significant activity. So I think they're having activity. They're just being pumped out. And this is a huge issue, I think, for a lot of the compounds that we would like <coughs> to take forward is how do we do that in the context of organisms that uh, would really like not to keep them? And is there a way that, that we can use a couple different processes in order to inhibit important enzymes but also retain uh, the drugs inside the cell? I and mean, just look at this uh, zone of inhibition. We see absolutely no activity at all in the wild type Pombi strain. So, again, as uh, Lorena said, what we did is also took a biological approach to think about the enzymes along this pathway to say, well, you know, since there, there are two enzymes here that may add a prenyl group, and there's only one enzyme here a little bit later in the pathway, wouldn't it make sense that some of these later enzymes if, uh, would, would be potentially better targets? These have been looked at in, in humans. Uh, we decided to look um, at them in fungi. So this was a cl uh, collaboration from a number of different lab groups. So uh, Sun Ban, who's here, um, his lab group uh, um, isolated uh, the gene that would encode the um, the, the methyl transferase uh, and made those mutants, Wukash uh, Kozabowski and uh, Sh um, Shannon Escher and, and my lab uh, looked at this uh, protease and then we've also uh, made knockouts for the Farnesyl and Geronal Geronal uh, transferase mutants. So in, in an initial publication that we did several years ago, we actually tried to knock this out and actually showed that it was essential by, by knocking a single allele out in a diploid strain and sporulating and dissecting and couldn't ever find uh, uh, the, the, the mutant form coming out. And then Shannon, uh, Escher in my lab, said, let's, let's look a little, a little bit different, in a different way. Let's, let's make the conditions really, 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 really permissive. I think we may be able to make um, a, a knockout strain. So sh instead of doing uh, sort of uh, typical yeast um, uh, incubations at 30 degrees, she went down to 24, 25 degrees. And sure enough, she was able to knock out the beta subunit of the Farnesyl transferase um, uh, enzyme uh, which we, we, we call RAM1. However, there is it's, uh, really conditional lethalness. You take the temperature up to anything that res results, uh, it mimics physiology, you see it, it absolutely falls out. It's really quite sick at 30 uh, degrees as well. But as you go up the pathway, beyond the, print, the, the actual parental transferase, now getting to those, those subsequent modification steps, we see that the, that the organism is much more, um, and m much better able to grow. 
And so it, it, as we proceed along that pathway, it appears that some of these other enzymes may not be uh, the best targets just uh, from in, in terms of looking at their effect on fungal physiology. What about their effects on RAS protein localization? Again, we're looking at RAS, uh, GFP RAS uh, protein um, localization as an output here in some of the different strains. In the wild type, we again see the characteristic um, cell surface predominant localization with some endomembrane staining. And when we mutate some of the more terminal aspects uh, of the pathway, we still see predominant plasma membrane staining. Uh, um, and, but when you mutate again that beta subunit for the foreign cell transferase, you see a significant but not complete decrease in the plasma membrane staining. And Sheenan actually tried to quantify this a bit by doing Western blots um, from different cellular fractions. So in the wild type, this is the total uh, GFP RAS protein uh, looking at the cell pellet, which would include all membrane structures. That's where most all of the protein is going. Looking at the soluble component, um, again, what would be present in the cytosol, she sees very little. And in contrast, in this strain where we believe we have decreased total membrane association by the, the, the GFP localization, we see, mo again, most of it now residing in the cytosol and not able to make it out to the membranes. However, there's still some in the membranes. So how is this happening? Now, could it be, as Lorena was saying, maybe some cross by, um by the, the general general transferase? Um, uh, is, is there some other modification that's happening that's allowing this, uh, this uh, protein to go to the membrane? But we, as we've demonstrated before, that one terminal cysteine is absolutely essential for localization uh, to, to the membrane. So um, this is a, sort of a very interesting uh, result. But even though we, we may see a little bit of decrease here, we, we, see, we still see all of the RAS appearing to go to the membrane portions in these uh, strains consistent with what we're seeing in terms of less severe phenotypes in these two mutants. When we look at the virulence associated phenotypes, again, the Varnacil transferase wins. Uh, it, it is absolutely, uh, um, uh, completely avirulent in animal and mouse models of cryptococcal infection, uh, while the, the, the more terminal aspects of this RAS processing pathway, they, they are significantly attenuated for virulence, but the virulence is not uh, completely um, destroyed in, in these mutants. So again, uh, the, what we've looked at so far are the, so the, the, the enzymes required for RAS protein prenylation, this first constitutive step without which RAS um, and, and many other proteins um, are unable to function, not being attached to membranes. But I'd like to, to think now about the, the, the other potential aspect of post-translation modification, the addition of this palmitate uh, group. So again, we, have, we can start with our genetic um, evaluation of this pathway because, uh, again, we can mutate these predicted uh, palmitylation cysteines at the C terminus of, uh, of the RAS protein in Cryptococcus. And you see that there are two of them here in Cryptococcus. Um, and if you mutate uh, any one of them, we still see a very similar pattern of RAS, GFP RAS protein localization um, uh, in that single mutant strain. However, if you mutate both of these cysteines, although we still see the RAS protein in the internal membranes, we fail to see any in the plasma membrane. Consistent with the model that is, it is this modification that takes it from internal membranes out to the plasma membrane. Does this have functional consequences? I mentioned before that if you don't get RAS to membranes, you have a completely dead RAS protein. So what does this protein, what functions does this protein now support? Interestingly, um, in a RAS, mut the, 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 they're, they're very sterile. So this is a mating reaction in a, between wild type strains, but if you mutate RAS, it looks something like this. You fail to see the, the mating filamentation response. If you mutate the, the both of the palmitylated cysteines, we still, it's still, this RAS allele still supports mating. So it still has some RAS function that's occurring from these internal membranes. However, it fails to grow at high temperature and looks phenotypically much like the RAS mutant. So it is that function the, the, that I think is the most interesting in terms of pathogenesis, the ability to grow at higher temperature that is mediated by um, its presence at the plasma membrane. And correspondingly, in animal models, this double palmitylation mutant RAS form is unable to support 
virulence in a mouse model. So, from that first genetic experiment with that one potential palmitylated protein, um, it looks as if there's, there's really s some relation to uh, pathogenesis. So what are the enzymes that mediate this process, the addition of this uh, palmitylation group to uh, various proteins? Well, we know from work in other um, species, including humans, that uh, many of these, these uh, uh, palmitol transferases or protein acyl transferases contain this DHHC domain present within these, uh, these sort of uh, dual transmembrane domains. And uh, so bioinformatically, Connie Nichols uh, went through the cryptococcal genome and found seven uh, potential DHHC-containing domain proteins, um, uh, again, potential uh, protein acyl transferases or, or pomidol transferases. And when you actually uh, put them in a, uh, some, some kind of genetic relationship with the human and Saccharomyces cerevisiae um, uh, orthologs, they, they fall into these really nice groups, uh, with seven of them to be uh, uh, exact, um, with one cryptococcal representative in each of the groups that have been formally identified in human and in Saccharomyces. Um, and so uh, Connie went forth and just began to make um, mutants of each one of these to see if, if they had any effect in RAS protein um, localization and function. Interestingly, even though that they're linked into groups, one of the important things to emphasize is that this is just a simple sequence alignment between the, the, our favorite of these pomodal transferases and the closest human hom homologue, and it's not very close. Uh, if, if you try to go and try to, try to find amino acid similarities, they're really not there. So maybe there's some greater structural similarity, but at the sequence level, these are quite divergent uh, proteins, um, hopefully predicting that we can uh, imagine some kind of fungal specificity for these enzymes. Just to, to look at this, you know, many of these, um, uh, these, these mutant strains, there were two, of, this is the RAS mutant failing to grow at 39 degrees. There were two of them that had some kind of similar uh, temperature sensitive phenotype. Our hypothesis being that if these were involved in RAS protein pomodulation, that we would see this kind of TS phenotype. Now again, one of the questions you're asking is, for goodness sakes, you have a family of proteins. How much redundant function are you going to have? So we're going to address that directly. But this was at least a first guiding principle for ones that may be the most interesting. We found that especially this PFA4 um, uh, here seemed to have some, some of the most interesting phenotypes and share phenotypes with the RAS mutant, including some of the morphological effects. I mentioned that RAS is involved in um, cell division and, and the ability to grow under stressful conditions. We see in the RAS mutant um, under at, at 37 degrees, they, they arrest as these large unbudded cells. Similarly, in the PFA4, they, they, they also are much larger than the wild type counterpart under these stressful conditions, though not quite as large and ugly as the RAS mutant <coughs> strains. Well, what about RAS localization? What happens, does RAS make it to the plasma membrane uh, in the PFA4 mutant? So the answer is sort of yes and no. Okay, so if, if you actually qu quantify the amount of plasma membrane localization um, here, there appears to be a, a bit of a decrement, um, but it's not that striking from the back of the room. I still see RAS present in the plasma membrane. When you stress the cells a bit, you lose a lot of the plasma membrane uh, staining in this uh, PFA4 mutant strain, perhaps suggesting that th th there is decreased palmitylated RAS. So we decided to measure by the <coughs> And there's this, uh, this new uh, um, uh, 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 assay by which you can actually measure um, palmitylated RAS1 using this acyl biotin exchange mechanism. And, and uh, in contrast to the, the, the total RAS protein, this is all uh, done by sort of a Western botting technique, um, you can see there is a decrement, significant decrement, by about 50 to 60 percent uh, on, on repeated experiments of the palmitylated RAS1 in this single palmitol transferase mutant strain. And then, so we went through and we made a dub double mutants and triple mutants and even a quad mutant. And we didn't see any improvement or any, any, any de decreased in, 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 in this. It's not as if there's, there's this tremendous compensation. The ones that we did mutate are expressed at very low levels and, and don't seem to really play a, a role in this pathway. So our, again, our working hypothesis is that this is the predominant uh, RAS1 protein pomodal transferase 
Um, and just to, to back this up a little bit, when we actually look at the localization of this, I'm gonna blow this up a bit, this is a lovely image. Um, again, this, we, you've seen this before, this is a, an anterior tag RAS, present at endomembrane structures and also the plasma membrane. And when we look at where the GFP PFA4, the pomodal transferase, is, is located and then you merge them together, it's present exactly where RAS is, so these internal membrane structures, where you'd predict it, uh, you know, being, um, for, forming its pomodulation to send RAS out to the plasma membrane. So I think further suggesting that, that, uh, that this truly is, uh, or confirming the, the biochemical result that we already have. So how much compensation uh, do we think is, is happening? Well, perhaps some, but not enough to really affect virulence. So we don't know, again, we, we believe and we know that, uh, that uh, the RAS may not be the only substrate of this enzyme, but when, when you knock out uh, this one pominal transferase, again, you see complete avirulence <coughs> in this animal model, and when we culture the, um, you know, for the organism out here, the, the animals who were unable to find viable cryptococcal cells. To sort of support our notion that um, there are other targets for PFA4 other than just the RAS1 enzyme. We do see some divergence of phenotypes. You know, for instance, there's to some cell wall stresses. We see the PFA4 is, is uniquely sensitive compared to the RAS1 mutant that is not sensitive to cell wall stresses. And there are some predicted cell wall biosynthetic enzymes that we think are, are likely modified by PFA4 as well. So this, just uh, in summary, this is just a, sort of a, a quick ride through some, what I, I think are really interesting uh, biological experiments that um, you know, address several different points in terms of thinking of, of, of uh, different processes for antifungal development. Um, we, we've identified some really key uh, proteins, RAS proteins and RAS modifying uh, enzymes um, in fungal pathogenesis. We've uh, begun to look at the, the concept of redundancy and compensation that can be uh, asked and answered at a biological level. Um, we've looked um, at different enzymes in a single pathway, uh, recognizing that uh, you know, all, all enzymes in a pathway may, may not be equal, even though it looks like sort of a, a linear pathway. And there may be certain targets that would be more effective uh, for, you know, for, for, for uh, the, the energy of subsequent uh, experiments. And even though we, you know, they, uh, uh, we tend to shy away sometimes from, the, from families of proteins in, in terms of drug development, per perhaps there are predominant members of families that would actually be uh, quite valid targets. So in conclusion, I just want to really thank um, the, this incredible rich environment that I get to swim in all the time. Uh, you know, uh, w wonderful uh, mycologists and bioinformaticians, great collaborators uh, in other departments, um, international collaborators, you know, people who work here, who, or that we meet other places, um, and then just the, the great people uh, in my lab. And uh, with that, I just want to thank you and entertain any questions. Thank you for